Good evening and welcome. My name is Mark Goffman and I'm a second year student here at the Kennedy School. Tonight's forum event marks the culmination of a year's planning. Last April, a group of students and I from across the country met with Mr. Perot and United We Stand to discuss issues important to students. It became apparent very quickly that the $4.5 trillion debt that faces us and that we are inheriting uh, is one of the most important issues that we need to face. Um, even more alarming is that we don't see an end to this trend. In fact, the year that I was born was the last year that the U.S. balanced its budget. We wanted to do something and we were hopeful. Therefore, uh, that's when the Kennedy School, the Institute of Politics, and Mr. Perot came in. Um, this morning, with the assistance of distinguished guests and faculty of the Kennedy School, we convened the first constitutional convention to address a balanced budget amendment since uh, 1787. This event is important because the last one, as you may know, formed the Constitution that we now use. And with 29 states across this country calling for another constitutional convention for a balanced budget amendment, we felt that it is also timely. But most importantly for us, it gave us the opportunity to practice leadership. And practicing leadership, getting in the position where we have to make the decisions as public leaders about what is responsible and appropriate, that is what brings us to a school like this. So it is my uh, honor now to introduce the Dean of the Kennedy School, Dean Al Carnesell. Uh, thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you to all of the students that worked so hard to make uh, today's convention possible and this evening's event uh, possible. We're all indebted to you. Now, it's my privilege to introduce tonight's speaker, Ross Perot. He's no stranger to anyone here, we know him well, and he's spoken in this forum before. Indeed, uh, much of the national debate about uh, the balanced budget amendment and a number of other issues are on the national agenda largely because he's put them there. Most of you know about uh, the American dream that our speaker has lived the boyhood in uh, Texarkana, Texas, his attendance at the U.S. Naval Academy, where he was a class president, chairman of the honor committee, and battalion commander, and his service on a destroyer and aircraft carrier. After he left the Navy, uh, Ross Perot worked as a salesman for IBM's data processing division. He quickly rose up through IBM's ranks. Uh, during this period, he made another wise move, he married Margot Birmingham. Um, using $1,000 that I understand she had saved as a school teacher, um, he started a one-man data processing company that eventually became Electronic Data Systems, a multi-billion dollar corporation employing more than 70,000 people. Now that's a lot better than you can do with $1,000 even if you invest it in the commodities market. <laughs> Um, now, uh, Margot Pro says that she has always thought of her husband as a problem solver, a man of action. And of course, she's right. In addition to uh, countless awards and all kinds of symbols of recognition, as well as a number of successful companies that bear his name, there are a number of less tangible but powerful examples of Mr. Perot's impact on his state and on our nation. Uh, at the governor's request, Mr. Perot led the Texans' War on Drugs Committee, proposing and getting passed into law a number of bills that made Texas the state least hospitable to illegal drug operations. Uh, later, another Texas governor, asked him to lead the effort to reform the state school system. And this too was successful and resulted in major legislative changes and improvements in Texas public schools. Uh, Mr. Perot's 1992 candidacy for the president, inspired by the will of large number of Americans, captured one in every five votes, the most by an independent or third party candidate since Theodore Roosevelt took just over 30% of the vote as the Bull Moose candidate in 1912. Uh, this grassroots organization 
United We Stand America, assembled by Mr. Perot during the campaign, has garnered national support and influence in this very rapidly changing American political landscape. The people and a substantial proportion of political leaders have responded to Mr. Perot's message of fiscal responsibility and government reform. We're fortunate to have with us tonight a patriot, an entrepreneur, a job creator, and a public servant. Please join me in welcoming Ross Perot. Good to be with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming tonight, and I'd like to commend all you college students for coming together on your constitutional convention. Uh, this is a very healthy thing in our country because this does belong to you. We'll be talking about some problems our country faces tonight that we must solve. I don't want any of you to get down in the dumps or discouraged. We're a country that has faced a lot of tough problems, and certainly it would be wrong to get discouraged in this city when you think about 200 years ago when farmers were dropping their plows and picking up their rifles and going out to make this country free. The problems we'll discuss tonight are nothing compared to that. But the fact that you have come together, and it's certainly appropriate that you have come together because we're spending your money and that's wrong. Now, I'm going to show you some stuff here that'll let you know how much this country, <laughs> how much this country loves you and how dedicated, how dedicated, no, I'm serious. I'm serious. I've got a poll that Merrill Lynch took that I just fell over just before I came up here that shows the willingness of parents and grandparents to sacrifice for you to clean this up. I'm dead serious when I say this. We love you, and we're not going to leave you a country where you can't climb every mountain, ford every stream, and follow every rainbow until you find your dream like we did. It's only right. We are racing toward a financial cliff. Now, history teaches us that nations, and particularly free nations, tend to go over the cliff and then say, oops, we better fix the problem. This is a problem of such magnitude that we cannot take that risk. We simply cannot let it happen. We must start now, and we are in the fourth quarter of the game to be starting. We've waited too long already. We're lucky. See, why weren't you and I, why aren't we starving to death in the streets of some country where the typical citizen is? Like, we could be somewhere in a country on the other side of the world where people are fighting to work for 25 cents an hour, and people are starving to death, but we are here. So we're very fortunate to live in the greatest nation in the history of man. Our challenge, very simply, is to make the 21st century the greatest in our history for our children. Every prior generation has done that. And when you think of what they didn't have, and you look at the infrastructure and everything we do have, it would be appalling if we couldn't. Back when we were nothing, every generation left the next generation a better life. We have to be good stewards. Just think for a minute about the people who created our country. They faced real challenges and risked their lives all you and I have to do is protect, preserve, and improve this great land. And while we have this obligation to pass on a better world to you, we still today are spending your money. We're leaving a debt that we cannot repay if we let it continue to grow. And one of our problems is that we have people in Washington who honestly think money falls out of the sky and that there is an unlimited supply of money, so any good idea we have, we will just pursue it. The real world is that money comes off the sweat of the brow of millions of decent, hard-working Americans who play by the rules, live in the center of the field of ethical behavior, do everything right, and never got the breaks you got. So particularly for you at Harvard and these other great elite schools in our country, never be arrogant. Never think you're special. Get up every morning and just count your blessings about how lucky you are. And if you ever can't come to that on your own, I'll take you across America and introduce you to people who are smarter than you are who never got to finish high school. You got the breaks, they didn't. And can I prove it to you? After 20 minutes, you'll say, yeah, he's smarter than I am, and she's smarter than I am. They didn't get the breaks, you did. People like you and people like myself who have been so fortunate have a special obligation to lead the way. 
and God bless you, you're doing it. So tax money comes off the sweat of the brow. So now, since we think money falls out of the sky in Washington, we're getting ready to levy a big new tax on companies to pay for health care so it won't cost the American people anything. <laughs> now, if this weren't a low-budget operation, I'd have Lawrence Welk in the background saying, wonderful, 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 right? <laughs> but let's just talk it through. Can corporations print money? No. How do corporations make money? They have to make money by making their products and selling it at a profit. And if our caretakers in Washington, and keep in mind the perfect theme song is someone to watch over you. I don't know, you young people may not remember the song, but I'm a little lamb who's lost out at sea, I just need someone to watch over me. That's not what a free people are all about. We look after ourselves and then we reach over and help the people who can't look after themselves. We don't want anybody looking after us unless we can't look after ourselves. So Washington says, don't worry about it, your company will pay for it. We say, well, that's terrific. Okay, now we know that companies can't print money. Companies have to make money. Companies make money by making their products, selling it at a profit. And if you do anything that increases the cost of making the product, you increase the price of the product. Now, I hope everybody makes 100 on this test, because I'd really be disappointed if you couldn't at Harvard. When we increase the price of the product, who buys the product? That's my simple question. Ordinary Americans, millions across the country, right? So who paid the tax? They did. It is the ultimate hidden tax on the American consumer. Here's the fair way to do it. If we're going to put in a health care plan that's going to cost a lot of money, the first thing to do is don't say this health care plan will save money. That's the first thing they said. Then the second thing they said is we cannot consider a balanced budget amendment if we want the new health care plan. Wait a minute, I thought it was going to save money, right? <laughs> then they said we've got to put it off budget or it'll run the deficit up. Wait a minute, I thought it was supposed to save money. Now that's what's wrong in Washington in a nutshell. Here's the way you handle that. Say, folks, we got this great new health care plan. It's going to cost you four or $5,000 a year apiece. Do you want it or not? If you say, whee, yes, <laughs> then, it's, then, you know, both eyes open, you got the straight word from the people who are your servants in Washington. So we will pay. You say, now, is that really true? The chairman of Godfather's Pizza stood up in front of the President of the United States and says, we can't afford it in my company, and he gave him all the facts and what have you. And the President looked him in the eye, and I keep in mind, delivered free in 20 minutes or, you know, delivered in 20 minutes or free. Guess who's buying pizza? Just regular folks, right? What was the President's answer when the chairman of Godfather said he couldn't afford it? Raise your prices. Okay, now I hope we're down to the bottom of where the money's coming from. <laughs> then we have all these interesting phenomena. Large companies, health care costs, that they negotiated away on union deals and really have gotten to become a burden to these big companies, will be lowered. So the truly beautiful people in the Fortune 500 will pay lower health care costs. The small business person will be nuked. That's N-U-K-E-D, if you can't understand my Texas accent. <laughs> You say, well, what difference does it make? They're just nobody out there in the middle of nowhere. No, they're not. That's 80 million people working for 6 million companies. And just in case Washington hadn't figured it out, watch my lips. 80 million people can elect every member of the House, every member of the Senate, and the President of the United States. So if you're going to be sensitive to someone, be sensitive to the small business, not the big businesses that want to dump it down on them and drive them out of business. Now, here's the White House's reaction. And the re you say, gee, is this accurate when I say it? March Reader's Digest. If you can't believe it in Reader's Digest, where could you believe it? So we can't be responsible for every undercapitalized entrepreneur. That's a reaction in the fact that it'll put small businesses out of business. Six million small businesses employing 80 million people. Dwarfs the Fortune 500. It's the heart of America. This is where your entrepreneurs are. We desperately need them now with our debt. No plan to balance the budget. And I'm sure the people in the meeting have gotten this, but here, only in America. Now, there is some truth in advertising right here in the President's budget on page 25. I didn't believe it. Believe it. I had them fax it down to me from Washington. It is a chart that says what the future generations will pay. Every young person here who's not yet had a child, we're talking about your children, 
your children. Right here it says, well, after the, before the Clinton tax hike, they would have paid 93% of their income in taxes. After the Clinton tax hike, they'll only pay 82%. That means you're keeping 18 cents out of every dollar if this forecast is right. Now, I'm going to get into government forecasting with you in a little bit. And weathermen before radar look very precise compared to government forecasters. <laughs> but, but, there's a constant. They always are overly optimistic in what they forecast. See, I've just defined we've gone off the cliff when the tax rate goes that high, and here they are saying it will go that high. I don't know why they did it, but I'm grateful they did. What's our ticket out of this? We've got to have discipline on spending. We've got to have a growing, expanding economy. Now, one thing that breaks my heart, and I'm a very average guy, and I'm not being modest. Everywhere I go, I've, no, I've, I was just very, very lucky. I had the right idea to write Mark Haley's comment. It comes around every now and then. Right idea at the right time, Margot loaned me $1,000. I surrounded myself, since I wasn't very bright, I surrounded myself with very bright, talented people. They carried me to victory after victory, and the rest is history. That's all there is to it, in my case. Okay. Uh, the, uh, but we've got to have a growing, expanding economy. We've got to have every American working at a good-paying job, paying taxes. We've got to put discipline on spending. They wouldn't even understand the phrase if I said it in Washington. They don't know what you're talking about. We've got to create economic growth. Now, the thing that breaks my heart as an average guy is, is I, tr I had multiple job officers when I came out of college. My whole generation did. It's a question of where you want to go to work. Everywhere I go, the young people who bring breakfast up to the room or take my bags to the room are college graduates. What in the world are the high school graduates doing? What in the world are the high school dropouts doing? What in the world happened to the great American economic engine that provided the taxes that gave us the ability to do all these wonderful things? See, all of these things over time, all of these things over time have caused us. Now, here is, I'll just give you one more specific example that's relevant to you, right out of the Wall Street Journal or New York Times, I can't remember which one. Two good sources, not as good as Reader's Digest, but good sources. <laughs> But, no, and I'll tell you through experience, nobody checks facts like this outfit. I've never had anybody in all my contact with the media over the years, they don't print it if they ain't got it nailed. Okay, but in the uh, Wall Street Journal, I believe it was, in the last two or three weeks, they said that college graduates in Delaware, nurses were being paid more than engineers because nobody needed an engineer. Well, I'm glad the nurses are making good money, but when nobody wants an engineer in Delaware, that's where DuPont's headquartered, right? Oh, they're downsizing. Let's stop using funny language. They're firing and laying off people. <laughs> okay? And that's a bad signal about where we're going. Now, I don't say that to get you stressed out. No, it shouldn't stress you out. You say, that's just another good reason not to go to the edge of the cliff. That's a good reason to start tonight to try to fix these things. Now, when John Kennedy was president of the United States of America, and this school is named for him, now, when you get worn out and stressed out about this sometime, look at the name on this school. That man gave his life for this country. We're not asking anybody to do that here. Now, we're here in Boston. Anybody know the name John Connors here tonight? Raise your hand if you do. Are, this, are, his, are his parents here? No, no, seriously. John Connors was a wonderful young man went to school here in this country, was a chemical engineer, then went to Germany in his junior year, didn't know how to speak German, learned German, made honors grades, came back, graduated, and became a Navy SEAL and was the captain of a Navy SEAL team when Panama went down. Now here is a wonderful man. He was in Bethesda Naval Hospital with some infection. He had some kind of skin rash. He had the perfect ticket not to go to Panama, right? He went AWOL, that's absent without leave and went to Panama. His mission of his SEAL team was to kill Noriega at the airport. You say, ooh, that sounds ugly. War is ugly. Noriega didn't come to the airport. John Connors got killed. And see, I could list a bunch of football players' names, rock stars, and athletes, and you know who they are. See, John Connors, Reese, John Kennedy gave his life for this country. John Connors gave his life for this country. Don't you and I have the will to just clean up a little financial mess? We can and we will.
and we owe it to them if we don't owe it to ourselves. Now, we've got to build our small business engine. We've got to get the entrepreneurs rolling again. But we have created an so that we have bigger and better jobs. The more you're making, the more taxes you pay, just very pragmatically. We'd like for everybody to be driving a limo, or riding in a limo. You don't drive a limo, but that means you're making a lot of money. <laughs> no, no, I want you sitting in the back seat. That means we're getting big bucks sent down there to pay off the bill after we put discipline in. But we make it very difficult to do business in the United States. We have an adversarial relationship between government and business. That's not good. It's very easy to do business in other countries. Now, keep in mind, we're the biggest market for goods and services in the world. Everybody wants to sell their stuff here, but nobody wants to make it here. Weird. And every day, we figure out a new way to let them do it. And every day, we close factories, put people out of work. And the standard of living for four out of five of our people went down, not up, during the 1980s, working people in our country, because we kept shipping the jobs overseas. Then we are a huge pool of capital, the world's largest pool of capital, but capital goes where the opportunity is, and if it's easy to do business overseas and there's an economic advantage to doing business overseas, the money goes overseas, the job goes overseas, the factories go overseas, and our people are hurting back here. When you're 4.5 trillion down, you've got to be building the job base here. We've got to have capital here, we've got to have cut down the regulations, on, particularly on the small businesses. Say, why am I preoccupied with them if each one of them will just hire one person? That's six million new jobs. You get those guys rolling, and it doesn't take them forever to get rolling. They just need an environment where the flowers can bloom, and they will do fine. They need less government interference, fewer regulations, access to credit, nobody will loan them money. And interestingly enough, I run into a lot of people who don't understand what capital is. Capital is money you put in a company, and you get a piece of the company, but the company never has to pay it back. It never has to pay interest on it. And boy, is that important when you're starting out, to have some money that you don't have to pay for or give back. That's very hard to do. Why won't people invest in the United States? It's like wildcatting in the oil fields to invest in a, sm in a small company. It's high risk, high failure rate. Why take the risk? Where's the incentive? Very simply, that's something government can change overnight. Create the incentive and the flowers will bloom, the jobs will be created, and we can move. If I don't get any other point over tonight, please understand that everything happens in Washington is if it were on a separate hemisphere or separate island and is unrelated. And I don't mean international affairs. When they consider these things, Everything we talk about tonight is intertwined. It all fits together. It's all like the spokes that hold the wheel together or the links of a chain. And until you look at it that way, you have problems. In other words, maybe a better way to say it, it's like the pieces of a puzzle that you have to fit precisely to create a workable overall solution. And when applying to new programs, we have to ask ourselves, like healthcare, what are the benefits, what does it cost, and can we afford it? See, we never say, we're like a family that's been rich for three generations that suddenly broke. We never had to say, can we afford it, right? Now we're back to that now, and we've got to always ask that question. Washington loves to offer us free candy. Now, young people, watch my lips. There ain't no free candy. There is no free candy. You inevitably will pay for the candy, and most candy that's... Uh, it's ch the parents, your parents as children said, don't ever take free candy, right, from a stranger? And that's my advice to you as adults. <laughs> don't ever take free candy from Washington. There's a bunch of strangers there. Because you will pay for it with interest. And there is a co much more cost-effective way to get candy if you need it. Hold that thought. And now, let me just go through quickly with some slides and define the problem... And I'm going to move these things pretty fast, but I hope to give you a quick overall look at where we are. Okay, sl uh, slide number one, please. Okay, there we go. Here is where the money comes from. Now look at the fact that only 45% of my money comes from federal income tax. See, you don't even begin to get the money you need. See, we get a total tax receipt of $1.25 trillion, but $560 billion comes from individual income taxes. Now compare that to Social Security. Look at how much money is being collected every year for Social Security. Can you see it all right? Okay, great. Now then, let's go to the next slide. Let's go now to where the money goes. If you'll remember, Social Security brings in $465 billion a year, but spends, we're spending $697. Now I've thrown some other things in there. These are all entitlements, Medicare, Medicaid, and other social programs. You look at the rest of it, it's just a little over half the budget. Now, if you shut down the Defense Department, 
the whole federal government paid interest on the debt, you still couldn't balance the budget. That's, that's where we are right now. Now let's go to the next slide. When I was a young man working for IBM, Social Security rates, I believe, were 5% a year. I used to have to program that into a computer. That's 2.5% from the employee, 2.5% from the employer. Look at them now. And now we're in 1993. We're up to 15.3%. And you go out to the year 2060, and you're up to 40%. That's just Social Security. See, that's a well-intentioned program that's out of control. But like the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, our people are, a few years ago we said, we've got to raise Social Security. We're going to create a trust fund and fix this. They took your money, they spent it, they left a note in the bank, you're going to pay for it on a current basis down the road, and you won't have enough money. Slide, next slide, please. If I went to somebody living in a mud shack that bought it on credit and said, let's finance this thing month to month, he'd say, Ross, you're crazy. This is a long-term deal. I've got to finance it long-term. Never finance long-term projects short-term, right? 101 in business. Actually, there's a better 101 in business. That is, don't ever borrow money. Just wait, just, just pay cash for everything you've got. Store money. I, looking forward to getting things is just as much fun as having them. And as much as you can, save your money and then buy it. <laughs> then you save a lot of headaches in life. Now, that's the way our country should operate, particularly when we're the world's last superpower. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now, let's look at the maturity of the publicly held debt. 83% of it is 10 years or less. Amazing that we would do that. Okay? When interest rates start going up, stand by. Interest rates are at a near, uh, you know, a low, or at a low from recent re years, and they will go back up significantly. Now, then, the next slide. Are we to the next slide, please? Uh, let's break it down. Zero to five years is 71%. 71% of our debts, five years or less, very interest rate sensitive. Let's assume $3 billion <coughs> is short term. Every time interest rates go up 1%, that's $30 billion a year increase in the deficit. Next, next one. Now let's look at the pattern. This goes back to our history of spending more than we make. Look back to Lyndon Johnson. It was just a little blip. Nixon was just a little blip. Ford started to grow. And then it's just become a cancer, and it continues to get worse. That is a bad trend, if any of you study trends, and I'm sure you do. Now let's take a look at the federal debt right now. <laughs> Next slide. There it is, 1993, we're at 4.4 .4 trillion. We at 4.46 this year. and. By 1999, the forecast, they always understate them, $6.3 trillion. Next slide, please. This drives the point home. Everybody west of the Mississippi rivers, ordinary income taxes go just to pay interest on the debt, and interest does not buy anything for anybody, and that line is moving east every day. <laughs> now, now let's, but let's get it down. Anybody here from California? Can you imagine that everybody in California works just to pay interest on the debt? That's bizarre. Now, I've just left out all the other states. I just picked the, the big gorilla on the West Coast. The next slide, please. Now, I'm going to give you a little short education on government forecast. The blue line is what the Reagan administration thought the increases in the debt would be for the first four years. The red line is what really happened. Now, there's always a rosy forecast out there. And I think the theme song for the Management and Budget Office should be Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Because <laughs> out there somewhere, it's always going to go to zero. Now then, the second tour, they matched it a lot closer, but boy, did we spend a lot of money. You see what I mean? Now then, you on that slide yet? Second, next slide. I have to say next slide. They don't, there it is. You see, they matched it up, but they spent a lot of money. Now, next slide. Here is George Bush's proposal during his, his uh, four years, <laughs> and it's like nobody learned anything, right? <laughs> We're back to over-optimism, over but there's an interesting thing that occurred. We got, watch my lips, no new taxes in 1988, and in 1990, we had the Tax and Budget Summit. Remember that? And they told us that if we would agree to the Tax and Budget Summit, this would balance the budget and pay everything down. We'd live happily ever after. We did. That's what you got. All right. Now then, let's take the next slide. Here's the Congressional Budget Office forecast after the Clinton economic plan is going to save us from ourselves, we passed by one vote, which was 
you know, pretty slim margins, but that's all it takes. <laughs> and what happens here, it takes off like a rocket and by the, never balances the budget. And by the year 2003, it's back up there at 360 or $70,000, billion. Uh, now let's take the next slide. Here's the pattern here. First 200 years, we were reasonably responsible. We didn't have anything, but we didn't spend it like we had it. <laughs> then we took off on a rocket. I hope that's clear to you. I won't spend forever explaining it. But that, over there in the yellow, that's 200 years. <laughs> and you say, well, Ross, how could that be? I'll read the words of Thomas Jefferson, one of the founders of our country. I place economy among the first and most important virtues and public debt as the greatest of the dangers to be feared. And we ran our country accordingly. Okay, next slide, please. You always say, Ross, those figures are so big, doesn't mean anything. Well, every family of four, it's 62,000 bucks a piece. And if you'll write the check, we can balance the budget tomorrow. <laughs> but they'll start going back in debt again. $62,000 from every family in the country just to get even. That money's not out there, as you know. Now let's look at what irresponsible management of ice. See, there are a lot of subtle things nobody talks about. Next slide, please. And it, it's not how many dollars you have, it's what a dollar will buy. When I was a young man in the Navy, uh, in Japan, a dollar was worth 360 yen. Now it's just a little over 100. So the Japanese have really changed the tilt on that one. But I had one good news. I came back from Japan. I was driving four sailors myself up to uh, Baltimore to see Margo. We got stopped by guys going five miles an hour too fast. Justice of the Peace took me in, so that's a $20 fine. And then he saw I had a 100 yen note in my wallet, which was worth 30 cents. He said, son, what's that? I said, that's 100 yen. He said, I tell you what, you pay me that and I won't even write you a ticket. <laughs> I gave, he asked for it, I gave it to him. I never drove through that town again. <laughs> but, but the point is, the point is, a $1950 bill is worth 18 cents today because of the mismanagement of our country, but Washington thinks it is wise to have a weak dollar. But down at Work in America, where we've got road scholars, that's ROAD scholars, <laughs> people that are street smart with common sense, they understand that that's not smart. Now let's take the next one. Here's the projected size of the federal deficit if we just continue on our trends. And the sad thing is, in the year 2020, the deficit will exceed our total budget today at a time when we are not building a giant industrial base to support the future growth of our country. Next slide. This is one that really concerns me. We got more people working at all levels in government than we have working in manufacturing in the good old USA. You say, why does that bother you, Ross? You can't be a superpower. You can't defend this great country if you can't make it here. You say, oh, we could just call in Asia and call Europe and call the rest of the world to ship stuff to us. Every ship is tracked by satellite every step of the way. It's just a question of where they want to sink them. You'll never get that stuff across the ocean. You say, well, we never have to defend this country. I say, yet. We better be prepared to defend it here. We've got to have the energy here. We've got to have the factories here. If we hadn't had those automobile makers here and those giant factories here when World War II started, we couldn't have converted those factories to work time production, right? We didn't have time to build them. We converted them and off we went. And you know why we won. Number one, don't ever sell what the soldiers and the sailors and the Marines did short, and the Air Force, Air Corps guys. But we could pump stuff out. It didn't matter how much stuff was destroyed on the battlefield. We could flood the battlefield with new goods. That's 101 in war. Destroy, destroy your enemy's ability to produce. Keep your own. Now then, the best paid jobs are in manufacturing. The best paid jobs are in manufacturing. We sent 2 million manufacturing jobs to Asia alone in the 1980s. If you want to see tomorrow, go to Hong Kong, drive into China, the first 40 miles on each side of the road, nonstop new factories. Then I say, come home, find me that anywhere in the good old USA. You can't. Go to some of those cities in Asia and you're looking at the cities of tomorrow. Come back home and go to our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. You'd think if our government could do anything effectively, they could have a clean capital, right? You go three blocks from the White House and there are people who've got bars in, on the windows and bars on their doors. Their neighborhoods have been abandoned to crime, but that's no problem because everybody in government's covered up with security. And they've lost touch with the decent taxpayer out there who it, children cannot literally go out in the yard and play. When you let this happen to the wage and the base in our country, you're nuking the tax base. Now let's go on to the 18, uh, next slide, please, 18 to 24 year olds. Now this is an interesting one. In 1980, 18% of the men made less than uh, 12,000, 29% of the women. 
1990, 40% of our men were making less than 12,000 a year and 48% of the women. And everybody says, oh, this, you know, having every woman work is a wonderful thing. I, I say 90% of them would rather be home. They have to work in order to pay the bills and keep the house together because we have lowered the wage rates in this country so badly by exporting jobs and having a job-unfriendly environment when we are the biggest market in the world. If you're the biggest market in the world, you control all the aces, but we give them away. The net result of this is we're back to the American dream while we're here tonight. Next chart, please. In 1947 to 1973, we could double the standard of living every 1.6 generations at our present rates. It'll take 12 generations. We're going to change that. You and I and all of us together can put that back where it ought to be. You say, well, maybe we're a mature country. No, we got everything now we didn't used to have, but we're squandering it. It's like, you know, we, we've got everything now it takes to play big time, but we're just sort of like people who inherited wealth and we're off playing instead of tending to the store. Okay, here are the tax rates. Next slide, please. This gets you out there. I just thought I'd flag up the 82% just to alert you here as we go out there. That, there we are for future. That's your children of all of you who don't have children now. Now, let me give you some good news. Merrill Lynch took a poll of the old guys to find out how we feel about sacrificing and fixing this. And that just fell into my office three days ago. Here is the first question. Next slide. If your grandchildren actually did face annual tax rates of 60%, do you think they would still be able to achieve the American dream? 86% say no. Next slide. Would you prefer the government to reduce spending on programs that benefit you or you, us, old guys? Or would you prefer your own personal taxes be raised? Reduce spending. See, everybody says the American people are, are, are not willing to sacrifice. Well, it looks like 69% would. It's hard to get 69% to agree to anything. Next slide, and you'll see one you'll love. Would, now here, these are your parents and grandparents talking. Would you sacrifice to save the American dream? 92% will do anything for you. Now, that shouldn't surprise you. Now, if you had never had children, it may surprise you, but after you have that first little baby and hold that little baby in your arms, you suddenly know for the first time how much your parents loved you. Then you will understand why 92% of the old guys will sign up for this trip. Would you sacrifice to prevent much higher taxes? 79%. Reduce the federal debt? 65%. Any one of those numbers is an overwhelming number. Next one. Which generation should sacrifice to put the nation's economic house back in order? 57% of the baby boomers said, put it on us. Now, they are 30 to 46 years old, I believe, is the definition of a baby. 30 to 48. And guess how many there are? 80 million. That's an army, folks. Just coincidentally, that's the same number of people that work in the small businesses. It's unrelated. But <laughs> either that or that's the only number I can remember. So, uh, <laughs> But to me, these are really exciting. This shows that the America we think is there is still there, and we're ready to go hit the wall, do whatever it takes. Now, just remember, when your ancestors came to this country, they came... And typically, number one, to be free, and number one, A, to practice the religion of their choice. Most of us don't even go to church. But just think how, imagine, say, you'd like to come across the Atlantic Ocean on a sailing ship so you could go to the church of your choice. You say, buddy, I don't go to the church of my choice now. I'm too lazy to get up. <laughs> See, that's because you can. When you can't, you will make a tremendous sacrifice to do that. They got off at Ellis Island. Do you think they wandered into New York City and said, is there some welfare program that will take care of me and look after me from now on? No, I'll tell you one story. Mort Meyerson's grandfather had to leave Russia because he was a Jew. Mort's the guy that made EDS what it was. Mort's the guy that is primarily responsible for my financial success. His grandfather came to Ellis Island. He lived in an attic in Brooklyn for two years as a tailor and for two years worked just to get a train ticket, enough money for a train ticket to Fort Worth where he had family members. Now that is hard work for a train ticket, right? got to Fort Worth, played by the rules, did everything right, had a great son, had a great grandson, and when he was 95 years old, he was at the meeting when I announced that Mort would be the president of EDS. He came up, he was full of steam, always, came up, hugged Mort, and said, through you, I have lived the dream that I had as a young man when I came to America. Now, if he's willing to live in an attic for two years, if he's willing to go through a son, a grandson, and wait until he's 95 to realize his dream, 
What we have to do here is not very hard. We just have to all unify to do it. Never forget that. I want to put something in perspective to you. It's the 50th anniversary of D-Day this year. One of the things I know is that young people have trouble understanding in large numbers that people your age fought and won that war. Is anybody here from World War II? Anybody here from World War II? Would you stand up, please, sir? How old were you when you enlisted? 17 years old. Every now and then I run into a 14-year-old. You probably knew a few of them, right? Big guys that just had to go fight for America. Anybody here from Desert Storm? Just to show you a young version. Stand, all you Desert Storm guys stand up. Okay, you can relate to them, right? They're just back. Just back. Now, these people did incredible things. Now, I hope they will run the story of Normandy Beach and D-Day and not Madonna's concert or something on the 50th anniversary. And if they do, if they do, I hope they'll tell you the story of a group of young rangers your age, 17, 18, 19 years old, the first to storm Normandy Beach, holding wooden ladders that they took from the British famine, laid them against a cliff at a place called Pont de Hoc. The Germans were raining everything in the world they had down on them, climbed those wooden ladders. Now, you're climbing one at a time with machine gun fire coming down on you. Got to the top, took out the gun emplacements, sent up a flare. Eisenhower sent the troops ashore, and the rest is history. But a handful of people just like you did that. Now, isn't balancing the budget kind of a piece of cake compared to... If I said, all right, you got two choices. Either balance the budget or we're going to go take Pont de Hoc again. <laughs> I'll take the budget, right? Okay, great. Don't let it worry about it. All right, so what does it take to get this done? Number one, just get up every morning and say, we own this country because we do own this country. It belongs to you, and it's up to us to fix it. And Thomas Jefferson again said, when the people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. And every government degenerates when trusted to the rulers of the people alone. The people are the only safe depositories. That's what we're talking about right here. So we know it, it's, uh, we've got a lot of work to do. We can do it all. No ifs, ands, and buts. Keep in mind a few things. We ought to pass as few laws as possible. Because every time you pass a law, you give up a piece of your freedom. Then if you have to pass a law, pass a law as close to the problem as possible. It's more likely to work. Now we pass these giant national laws. Do you think healthcare in South Dakota is the same as healthcare in New York City? See, Washington has a one shoe fits all mentality. If I were a cobbler or a maker of shoes, I would love that idea. I would make one pair of shoes and you just squeeze into it, right? <laughs> you think I'd stay in bed? No, I've got to make a shoe that will fit your foot or you won't buy it. That's what you can do if you pass laws. Pass them at the local level. And make sure that the law, it works for the benefit of the people and don't get into these runaway programs as we have endlessly done. We have one challenge and that is the Tocqueville when he studied our country concluded that America was great because her people were good and then he went on to say if America ceases being good America will cease to be great. The goodness at the grassroots level in this country is just magnificent. And I could tell you a thousand stories of wonderful, wonderful people. There's a feeling on the part of young people that the way things used to happen can't happen anymore. You know, for example, things happen because people like you at your age who don't know any better go out and make them happen. And you say, well, okay, Ross. I say, what about two bicycle repairmen from Dayton? Every time you see a big airplane fly over, say, two bicycle repairmen did that. Now, that ought to excite you about what you can do, right? You say, didn't they have a government grant? No, a man named Dr. Langley had the government grant. Those bicycle repairmen aced him. These weren't even new bicycle builders. These were bicycle repairmen. Now, think about it. <laughs> they did it, right? Thomas Edison's teachers thought he was dumb. Thomas Edison, every time you land at night, look at those lights and said, he did that, I can do that, right? You can do that because you are free and because you can do whatever you want to do in this country, and that is the most precious thing we have. You say, Ross, that's so long ago. Do you have anything that's current? Think of... <laughs> yes. Think of, I'll tell you, a Harvard guy. Got bored up here, dropped out, and built Microsoft. <laughs> need I say more? <laughs> do I even need to mention his name? Bill Gates. 
And you say, well, that's just one, all right. How about this young man I ran into that was uh, so bright, they let him sit in engineering classes at Stanford when he was in high school, so poor he couldn't go to college. So he was in his dad's garage playing with chips, and one day his dad walked in and said, son, either make something you can sell or go get a job. <laughs> 60 days later, the first Apple computer was put in a store in a wooden box made by Steve Jobs' dad. It's an ugly little thing. <laughs> did IBM revolutionize the world in computers? They did the first time around. Who did it the second time around? A high school graduate working in his dad's garage. He had to do it, and he did it. Now, if you have this same drive, and if you have this same desire, and if you have the same love for your country that John Connors had, and I could tell you stories by the hour of these wonderful, wonderful people who literally gave their lives for our country, that are your age, they're gone. I can t tell you the stories of the children that grew up without their dads, the young, young wives, your age, that never remarried again because they loved him so much. All we have to do is go clean up a little financial mess here. We have to put discipline on spending. I think we're going to have to have a constitutional amendment that forces the balanced budget because there is no discipline on spending in Washington. We were promised at the Tax and Budget Summit that Congress would cut its costs. To make my point, Senate employee benefits are up 44% since the summit. Congressional printing is up 48%. Mail costs are up 44%. Cost of employees and standing committees is up 55%, and finally Congress gave itself a 23% pay raise in 1990 in the middle of the night. That's not dealing straight with us, the taxpayers, with the taxpayers who pay the bill. In 1950, Congress made $12,500 a year. Now they make $133,600 a year today. They have a cost of living adjustment. That's COLA, and in plain talk, that means every time the dollar goes down, their salaries go up. You and I don't have that. I don't think that sort of thing's appropriate. So we've got to have government reform, and we can get it, and we will have it. You and I just have to work together as a team to get it done. Now, in closing, I want to go to Q&A before you guys all go to sleep here. Everything I've said, I'm going to sum up in a few words, and after I do that, you're going to say, Ross, why didn't you just say that and skip the rest of the speech? <laughs> if I can really do that. Here it is. The budget should be balanced. The treasury should be refilled. Public debt should be reduced, and the arrogance of public officials should be controlled. That's all I've said, right? Now, obviously, those are not my words. I mention them to you tonight because Cicero spoke those words 2,000 years ago, proving that in an ever-changing word, there are some things that never change, and one of them is human nature. Human nature hadn't changed a lot. Man cannot stand success. Adversity breeds strength, and success breeds arrogance and complacency. And I can give you a thousand examples, and it's as old as the history of man. We have been so successful so long, we have become arrogant and complacency. We've got to hit the field, get back in shape, and go back, and not let adversity make us tough again. That is the dumbest approach we could take because of the size of the deficit. We've got to have government reform. We've got to pay our debt. We've got to have a balanced budget amendment. We've got to make the 21st century the best in our country's history for our children. We must jealously guard our individual freedoms and not have a government that's taking care of us. One of the image makers for the President of the United States just recently said, and I'm amazed they still have him on the payroll, he said, we want the American people to be dependent on the President because then they'll vote for him. I rest my case. Now, we have to do this for those we love the most, our children and grandchildren. And now I'm going to close with Thomas Jefferson's words, because this takes us right back to when the Constitution was written. My confidence in my countrymen generally leaves me without much fear of the future. And mine does too. I know you'll do it. I know we can do it together. But just sitting around talking about it won't get us anywhere. God bless you. You're here. You're having your little Constitutional Convention. You're talking about it. You're shaking the trees. See? And we've got 29 states, and people have fought, bled, and died to get those 29 states. Give me the challenge. Give you the challenge of five more. How would you like to be looking at 34? This is only five to go. And that's something nobody can stop if the people want it. It's a privilege to be with you tonight, and now I will stand by and take your questions. Thank you very much.
Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, there are microphones, uh, two down here and two up there. Please uh, identify yourselves and try and keep the questions brief. We can start right here. Good evening, Mr. Pro. Um, my name is Melissa Liazos. I'm an undergraduate at Harvard and a member of the Student Advisory Committee here at the Institute of Politics. Um, my question is about the balanced budget amendment. It seems that Congress sometimes has a history of passing legislation and then not doing much to enact it. Do you think that if the amendment is passed, they would actually reduce spending, or do you think they would turn to other measures like cutting taxes, or do you think they would pretty much just ignore it? Well, well let's look at what they just did. See, we're moving toward a constitutional convention. No place to run, no place to hide. The people will determine it. Congress did what everybody anticipated they would do. They decided to run ahead of the people. Then Senator Simon from Illinois introduced a real balanced budget amendment. And this is Washington, D.C. 101. Then a Senator Reed from uh, Nevada introduced a sham amendment. That way, everybody could go back home when they run and say, I voted for the balanced budget amendment, but nothing got done because they split the vote. There should have been a national outrage over that. But that is a, just a classic pattern of how you finesse things like this. All right, the next step is to have the people call it at the state level. Then they're stuck. Now, the last thing we need is something with holes in it. Either have a balanced budget amendment or don't have one. But don't, if Congress wants to run ahead and do one, it's got to be real. It's got to have no place to run, no place to hide. If, now, if you have a big war or something like that, obviously you're going to have to do what it takes at that time. But I feel very, very strongly that we should never send people into combat. Let's assume it's going to be a one-day war. I think we ought to put a 10% tax on every American that day. Now, people just cringe when I say that. I say, well, fine, you can avoid it if you go into combat. Those guys won't have to pay taxes. They say, put me on for the 10% tax. <laughs> that kind of clears your head, which is better. But we should, you know, if we're going to ask people to bleed and die, then we should all bleed financially during a war. That means we believe in it. We're committed to it. It's not Vietnam. We're not going to leave our guys over there to rot. We're going to be focused on it like we were in World War II. But that's about the only hole you need is some major thing like that. Don't leave many windows to jump out of because they are experts at figuring a way out. Graham Rudman was a good idea, but the holes killed it, right? So, no, we can do it. We can do it through the Constitutional Convention. If they run ahead with a balanced budget amendment, we've got to really run up the flare. We want a real one or skip it, because we're headed to the convention. If they'll give you a real one, it saves a lot of headaches, right? If they'll give you a real one, fine, done. That's what they ought to do. That's what you're paying them for, is to reflect the will of the people. Uh, good evening, Mr. Perot. My name is Ishan Zaidi. I'm a sophomore at the college. Right. Um, now, you've done a good job showering us with anecdotes and charts, uh, charts and your bottom line has been uh, we need to balance the budget, we need to reduce the deficit, and the will is there. But I think America has reached a stage at which its population is used to the services that the government provides right. and is not willing to pay more taxes. Now, it's one thing to enact a balanced budget amendment, to, to instate right. it, but that's not enough. You have to make the choices. You've got to decide how you're going to balance the, the budget. You're going to have to either raise taxes or cut spending in certain areas. Um, you've made no mention about how you're going to do that. How would you specifically, if you were president now or if you were in the CBO, right. how, what would you cut right. specifically or which, which types of taxes would you raise to actually raise, uh, to actually, sorry, balance this budget, which you're talking about doing? Okay. I've, I've spoken on that on a number of occasions. but. And the, I would say, and I'm going to answer, but it, it, the best book I've seen on this subject is uh, Pete Peterson's book, who, who works with the Concord Coalition. They have a very, if you want to really get specific, and it's a, you know, it's a book this thick, and that's what it takes, but you've got to go straight to entitlements. You're going to have to get into that. First, the easiest thing to do is take away the entitlements from everybody that doesn't need them. The president's economic advisor, when Bush was president, said that's $100 billion a year. Let's assume he's accurate, or let's assume he's 80% accurate. Take the one you want to take, but he was the president's advisor. Then they had the GAO did a study that says $180 billion a year in waste. If you go straight for the waste, if there's $180 billion in waste, do you realize we have something we call overhead that's bigger than the government of France? That's 100 and some odd billion dollars that you can go take huge, I'm going to places you get huge chunks. There's $100 billion in the IRS. I've had three IRS commissioners tell me there's $100 billion a year they don't collect because of antiquated computer systems and what have you. Well, just you go to the entitlements, 
remove the to everybody that doesn't need them doesn't get them anymore. Certainly, people who have been lucky enough to have the money to take care of themselves in their elderly years and to pay their own health care, they don't have to do that. Give it to the people who need it. That's what built this country. People who had the means would give their money to people who didn't through charity. And if you want to use government as your charity source, that's not the best one because you lose so much in overhead. But I just went through more than enough there to balance the budget. Now then, you've got to have a growing, expanding economy to ever pay down a $4 trillion debt. Would you agree on that? First step, for, it's like a patient in the operating room. Stop the bleeding. I just stopped the bleeding with some of the examples I gave you. I more so. than enough to balance the budget. <laughs> okay? All right, let's take $180 billion of waste, $100 billion of entitlements that people don't need. That's $280 million, right? That, that, billion. that amounts to ta taxing the rich more by taking the money that would be paid back entitlements and not giving it back to them. All right, would, do you think I'm going to stay up at night if I don't get Social Security and Medicare? Yeah. I mean, so I, I, I don't think you're going to spend much time feeling sorry for me, are you? Well, I'm just clarifying that is sure. an no, increase no, but the, in, no, in taxes. Ex in absolutely. You right. call it a tax, call it a dog, call it anything you want to, but you're taking the money. Right. Now, so you go through these different areas of these huge, giant pockets of waste. And uh, then we just have the will to do it. We don't have the will to do it. That's the reason you have to have a constitutional amendment that forces Congress to go in and do these things. See, politically, they want to give us candy. They don't want to take anything from us. I said, oh, you're going to take my Social Security? I'm so depressed. They said, oh, well, keep it. They, no, no, if they have to do it, they say, no ifs, ands, and buts. We've got to do it because you don't need it. And I said, well, you're right. No, you, you've got to face it. See, this forces discipline on spending. Now there is none. No, the pot is there. We know where to go. Get Pete Peterson's book. It is really, really well done in several hundred pages, and that's the level of detail you deserve uh, you know, to get a total answer. But no, finding it, it, it it's, it, the places are there, and you can get it. But you have to have the will to do it. Okay, yes, let's sir. get one, one up there. Can you see oh, I'm sorry. There? Yes, sir. How are you? Hi, Mr. Pro. My name's Keith. I'm a second year student here at the, uh, at the Kennedy School. <laughs> <laughs> And I'd just like to say that back in the fall of 1992, while I was here at the Kennedy School, I supported you and I voted for you. Uh, since then, when Congress, I voted for you because I thought it was important to send Washington a message that growing the economy and reducing the, the deficit were important. Since then, in the summer of 93, Cong Congress proposed a 4.3 cent uh, gallon gas tax, which you opposed, which was less than the 50 cent a gallon gas tax in your plan. When Congress and the President tried to grow the economy with NAFTA, you had the only economist on the planet who thought that it would not grow the economy. <laughs> Do you intend to run again in 1996? I'd like a chance to rectify my mistake. Well, I, I doubt if you'll have a chance, but no, no. I appreciate, I appreciate the fact that you are active and involved. I, you're very kind of voted for me once, but whether you vote for me is the least of my interest. My interest is that you stay active, stay involved, and number one, I did not oppose the, the gasoline tax. Number two, I did oppose NAFTA. Number three, watch it. Okay? okay. Thank you. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Come back up. Let's make a deal. Five years from tonight, call me collect. Okay, thank you. Got you. it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pro, my name is Jonathan Edwards, and I'm the, the state director of the Concord Coalition here. I wanted to preface that so you knew where I was coming from. Uh, I want to thank you first for, for supporting deficit reduction, because it does organizations like, like the Concord Coalition a great benefit. But my concern is that, that people discuss uh, the, the, the lack of a need for Social Security and Medicare for affluent people such as yourself. Uh, but and, and they talk about waste, fraud, and abuse, but then they don't talk about the difficult issue of Medicare and Social Security for people who are earning fifty or sixty thousand dollars a year in entitlements, yeah. or I'm sorry, in in, in retirement uh, income, yeah. and and that's the challenge to convince the American people that that those people need to uh, sacrifice a little bit. No, they'll have and, to. And I want you to talk to that. No, when we they, I'd call that upper income retirees who are lucky to have big retirement plans, cash in the bank, investments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, absolutely. What's the name of Pete's book? Uh, Facing Up. Facing Up. I thought so, but I didn't want to give this young man the wrong name. Facing Up. Thank you. My name is James Hines. 
Mr. Perot. My family's here tonight. <laughs> Mr. Pro, you seem to be concerned about the term structure of federal debt, and uh, in particular that the government is doing a lot of borrowing at short term rather than long term, right. uh, 90 days rather than 30 years. I'm surprised at that. If the future is as bleak as you describe it, then uh, borrowing with 30-year bonds would be extremely expensive because you know the interest rates would be very high, and in addition, uh, if a lot of the government debt were long maturity, then it might become uh, tempting for the government to finance some of the debt by inflation, which in many ways is the most expensive tax of all. So doesn't it make sense to finance the government short? And in, in addition, if we do put our uh, financial house in order, it would help pay for itself that way by uh, we wouldn't have to wind up, uh, if interest rates become lower, paying for the debt uh, at long all right, uh, you, you're, you've been uh, watching the economy for how many years? Uh, 14. Okay, how, what's, the high, what's the highest short-term interest rate you've seen? About 20%. I rest my case. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, if, if you're willing to risk that, what is it, over 80% of the economy to that kind of an interest rate fluctuation, See, the real world, any private person, any business person would say, while interest rates are down, we better nail this thing down and hedge, not just put it all at risk. The way the game is played, anything will be done to make this year's deficit appear to be smaller. Nobody worries about down the road. My name is Theo Lubke, and I'm a, a second year MPP student. Uh, before asking my question, you, you mentioned that all Americans came here to be free. I would just like to respectfully remind you that Many Americans neither came here out of their own free will nor were free when they arrived in this country, and it's important to not, not to forget that, at least in my mind. Uh, my, my, my question to you is that the economic woes of our nation are felt perhaps most strongly in depressed urban areas, and I'm wondering, short of a balanced budget amendment and short of revitalizing the entire econ economy, what programs that you would advocate to encourage growth in urban areas that have not seen much growth and have not seen much, many opportunities for the residents over the past 20 or 30 years? Well, the first thing we need to do is have social programs that encourage people to get back into the ring and be productive and keep their self-esteem. What, what types of social programs are those? Well, let me finish. Okay. And I am very, very, very much aware that not everybody came to this country of their own free will. And so, I mean, that, it's kind of like asking me if I can see your ears. Yeah, I can. So, uh, and I am very sensitive about it, and I don't talk a lot about it, but I do a lot about it. Mm -hmm. So let me suggest that maybe, I hope that you are spending a lot of time, even as a young person, so you can go down and help somebody in the inner city. Do something, do something, all of you. Don't just sit here and pontificate about the theory. Go down there and help, and I'm sure you are, but I encourage you to do it. Now, so first, our welfare programs destroy people. They don't rebuild people. Let's start with the American Indian. We ruined him. He was a warrior. He was an empire builder. He came from China to Alaska all the way down to the tip of South America and built empires. Nothing kept him from going until we put him on the reservation. The Industrial Revolution took place. He was not a part of it. He could stand anything except being held back as society changed. Keep the people who we now have, in effect, on the Indian, we have new Indian reservations in every city. In effect, we pull people out of society, we take care of them. The more illegitimate children they have, the more money we give them. We even give them single women fertility treatment so they can have more illegitimate children. Now, only in America would we ask working America to give money for that. Is that a real dog or somebody? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's got a good imitation if it's not. Now, basically, here's the sad story. That's the reason I want my friend up there to call me in five years. The very jobs that could work best in the inner city will be the first jobs to go to cheap labor overseas. Now, honest work is honest work. In a minute, I will make shirts, I will make shoes, I will do whatever it takes to take care of my family. There's nothing wrong with that. That's honest work. See, we say, oh, that's not sophisticated work. Well, we got a lot of people 
that in this generation are not sophisticated, who need jobs to give them self-esteem so that their children can have an opportunity and they can start to live the American dream. Just warehousing them on welfare, and we've got second and third generation welfare people now, is not rebuilding those societies. Those are fine, proud people that are capable of anything that you've referred to. They are Americans. These are people that deserve to live the American dream too. We've got to be very careful that we don't continue the government programs that keep them wards of the state. Now, there are lessons to be learned. As we get bigger and bigger government, we are more and more becoming wards of the state ourselves. So if that happened to them, it can happen to us. If we lose our survival skills and if we lose our hunting skills, then somebody will need to take care of us. Talk to the people in the inner city. Most 99 out of 100 don't want to be taken care of. They want to go be productive and successful, right? They want to live the dream. I know that. Then when you finally put a job in the inner cities, nobody will provide credit or capital. It's a dangerous place to put it. So you got a problem there. And believe it or not, our government creates no incentive at all for people who have money to invest to invest in businesses in the inner cities. I would say, let's start up a business in the inner city, and if you'll put money in it, let's assume it becomes Walmart too. You don't ever pay any capital gains tax. Gross is net in your pocket. You're going to show up for that, right? You'll take the risk if you've got a good person running the business. I've given you a reason to go wildcatting, to use an oil field term. I've got to give you a reason. Now then, credit. Our government's own policies, the own, our government's policies, make it very difficult for banks to lend money to the small entrepreneur, and that includes the small entrepreneur in the inner city. We're back to capital and credit, and it's very important every time I say capital to point out, that's money you put in your company you don't have to pay interest on, you don't ever have to pay back. That's very precious money when you start a company. So if we had capital and credit, and we stopped shipping those jobs overseas, look at the jobs that have gone to Taiwan, look at the jobs that have gone to China, look at the jobs that have gone to Guatemala, Look at the shirts coming out of Thailand made by child labor. If you didn't see the television show, these are malnourished children. I've got one that a, a person bought on the streets, bought in a store in Hong Kong that had been shrink wrapped for the U.S. They bought it at a store made a profit in Hong Kong, department store, four bucks. Had a $24 tag to be sold in the U.S. These high powered tennis shoes that kids kill one another for in the inner cities, they're all made over there in Asia and they've got about maximum three dollars labor and material content and the rest is paying off sports stars and big buck advertising. What in the world is this? See we are the market, the buyers are here, we ship the jobs over there, the people that could have done those jobs well that would have been thrilled to have those jobs don't have a job and we run around saying why 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 and then the government says that's right we'll have a job stimulus program and if you read the fine print they were going to spend eighty nine thousand dollars to create each job and they defined a job as one person working for one year. Give me a break. This is a working level job. I said add $1,000 to it, make it 90000 divide it by six and give 15000 bucks a piece to six people and let them get by for a year and look for a job. 70% of that would have gone to overhead, typically in a job training program from the U.S. government. Now that's our government solution. See, now with stars in your eyes, ooh, let's do the job stimulus. Read the fine print and you wouldn't go within 10 miles of it. Now, I would say do it in a minute if it would help the people. But the saddest thing in the world is to promise people in despair a dream and then not deliver the dream. A lot of the turmoil in the inner city, I'm, I, I'm going to get off this one subject, but it's so important, and I'm glad you brought it up. Do you think that if we ever hit the cliff financially, Americans are going to patiently stand in line looking for work like they did in the Depression? We're going to have a revolution in this country. That is an overwhelming reason not to let this happen. We've got to get to it early and fix it quick. Step one, stop the bleeding. Step two, rebuild the economy and pay off the debt through the expanded tax. Interesting phenomena here. Four and a half trillion in debt, we should have utopia. Can we agree on that? We should have a big debt plus utopia. We should have the finest public schools in the world. We used to. Now then we got the big government and we have some of the least effective schools in, in the industrialized world. We're the most violent, crime-ridden society in the industrialized world. That's what big government brought us. And we've got 5% of the world's population and 50% of the world's cocaine use. Big government didn't work. I rest my case. All right, next one.
Mr. Pro, my name is Clint Hino. I'm one of the many military members here at the Kennedy School. Um, I was reading the other day an opinion that said that uh, if, the, if the balanced budget amendment was passed, it would be the U.S. Armed Forces that would lose the most because we could expect that lawmakers would decimate the defense budget first before they'd go after any other programs to make sure that they met that balanced budget. What do you think about that? Well, we'd have to give an Oscar for stupidity if they did it, but uh, the point has merit. We cycle our military. We nuked our military during Vietnam, after Vietnam. Morale was so bad, guys wouldn't even wear their uniforms to the Pentagon. <coughs> then, over a period of 12 to 15 years, we rebuilt it at a cost of trillions of dollars into the finest military operation in the world. And now we're going through what I guess is the standard American cycle. Is, see, we're starting to cut back, cut back, cut back. Hopefully, we will have learned through having done that several times. Number one, it's not cost effective. Number two, you can't ever leave this nation vulnerable. And number three, uh, we carry a huge burden as the world's only superpower. And we need to use our military forces very carefully and not just you know, throw them out there like we did in Somalia. But uh, that's a, just a sad case that happened. But uh, it, it, you know, that's easy to say. But talk to the wife of the man who was dragged through the street. You remember that? Her children will grow up without a father. She will grow up, go on through life without a husband. He's gone. You know, so you have to use them sparingly. But a constant in history, and this is just a fact, is war is a constant in history, and we have to keep our nation strong. You're right, there'll be a contest there, but that's not an excuse. For example, if I've got a friend who's drinking too much, and I'm worried about his liver, he says, you know, I gotta keep drinking too much because I think it's good for my blood. I says, well, but your liver's gonna get you. See, we will not be able to support the military if we let this country continue to drift financially as we are. We've got to turn it around and stop it, and hopefully we'll have people in Washington that have the sense and discipline never to put our country at risk. That's the most precious thing we have. And never to assume we will never have to defend it here. See, we've been very lucky, right? Yes, we've sir. never had to do the down and dirty fighting here. Don't count on that forever. Be prepared for it either way, and then you're not likely to have the problem. Excuse me. Go back up there. Yes, sir. Mr. Perot, my name is Larry McGid, and uh, I'm a member of Jim Hines' family here at the Kennedy School. Um, and uh, my friend who was up here before, Keith, asked me uh, just to ask you a uh, quick question. Uh, he needs your phone number so that he can make that collect call. Just tell him it's in the book. Call me collect. Okay, Keith, you got that? Um, and, and, and tell him let's make a bet. I'm going to send him on all expenses weekend for two anywhere in the U.S. What's he going to do for me? <laughs> you give it both ways. Oh, five years from now, you'll have enough money to send me anywhere. What, what's the bet about? That, uh, that it, it is obvious even to you that NAFTA didn't work after five years. Think I'll take that bet. No, no, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Um, my question uh, relates also to, to Wait NAFTA. a minute. What happened to all this certainty and enthusiasm? <laughs> I wouldn't hold you to it anyhow. You know that. <laughs> but you'd hold me to it. <laughs> Go ahead. Who's that? Mr. Brown, oh, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, is there yeah, a question there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. My question has to do uh, with NAFTA and in general with the question of whether we should be trying to compete with countries that are using child labor, be trying to compete with countries that have wages that are orders of magnitude lower than what we have in this country. Um, and, you know, is that a strategy that you, that you think we really ought to pursue? Or do you propose a solution where the engineers that you pointed to when you talked about the engineers earning less than nurses um, can actually be the ones who are driving the economy and, and everyone can have a job that requires the kind of education and would bring the kind of wages that an engineer would get. If we stop making things, we will cease to be a great country. Anybody wants to bet on that, we'll put a five-year tag and let you set the terms. But if we stop manufacturing, we will cease being a great country. We will cease having a strong middle class. That is America. 
Forget the Fortune 500, forget the Forbes 400. I just went through 900 votes, big deal, right? Let's go down here to the real world and the real people who make it all happen. Middle class America, that's where the tax base is. You say, oh, come on, Ross, let's tax the rich and cure this. I've said for years, take it all. Now, I'm just bluffing, but I say I take it all. <laughs> and if you took all the wealth from the Forbes 400, you would not have enough money to balance the budget for one year. Now, you got them all on welfare. All my point is, it's working America who carries this country on their shoulders. If they're making good wages and manufacturing wages for working folks are the best wages we have, then we've got a tax base. If they're not, and everybody's working at a minimum wage, we won't have the tax base we need. We've got to make it here. You say, all right, how do you make it here? We've got the world's biggest ace. We're the market. Just look at my own grin and say, guys, you all want to sell here, don't you? And they'll say, oh, yes. So try and make it here. And they say, oh, my gosh, we can't do that. Since fine. You've got child labor. You've got children you're not even feeding. You've got guys working for Zenith Television down in Mexico. People used to be up here, made $20,000 a year. The people down there, the man's dream is to someday have an outhouse. Hope that makes your friend real proud. Okay, someday have an outhouse. They were so badly treated in Mexico. Now, they live in cardboard shacks with dirt floors around the plant. That's true of U.S. automobile plants. I show you videotape, if you guys will show it up here, of a chemical company from the U.S. that's dr drilling holes in the ground and dumping chemical waste in the ground, and the newborn babies and the families are, that live around the plant in shacks are just decimated. I'd say to all those countries, we're going to put a social tariff on you. Now, we, you've, your workers, interesting enough, Mexican workers be 90% as productive as our worker. We pay him 14% of what we pay our worker, give him little or no benefits, treat him like trash. That's one of the reasons you got all those peasants going around down there. The one thing that may bail your friend out is how the election comes out. See, corporate America is holding back to the election. If, they, if the PRI wins, then you'll, I'll win. If PRI doesn't win, I'll pay him. I'll be glad to pay him for that reason because the peasants are saying we've had it. History teaches you that if you oppress people for too long, they rise up. See, the same young man who was so concerned about the members of the black community in this country, I'm sure he is equally concerned about any nation anywhere in the world that would treat people like I'm describing. We had a strike in one of the big three automobile makers' plants. They called on the police. They shot, I believe it was 22 people, they killed a couple, they threw the union out, they cut the wages and put the workers back to work. Is that something you're real proud of? See, that is a recipe for future disaster in that country. The people will someday say, enough of that. Now, all you have to say is put a social tariff in. You've got good people. You've got good factories. Anything you want to make in your country that you want to make dirt cheap, we're going to collect a, a tariff that's b the difference between the wages and benefits we pay our people and the cost of doing business here and the cost of doing business in Mexico so, or any other nation, and there's no advantage to doing business down there. We've put the playing field back level. You say, can we get away with that? Sure. We're the biggest market in the world. I used to laugh at my friends in Japan because they just really were flexing their muscle a few years ago about how they were taking us out. And I said, you're missing the point. Who's your biggest customer? They said, you are. And I said, if we don't have jobs, we can't buy your electronics. And I'll never forget that meeting. They just stared at me for about a minute. <laughs> and you notice the Japanese started building a lot of factories in this country until they had their big recession. They started building car plants in this country. They had big recession. They said, wait a minute, we want these people working. They finally got Henry Ford's message. He said, I want my people to make enough money to buy my cars. That's capitalism in its purest form, right? What we've got is a situation where they will destroy the market they were chasing if we put in a social tariff, phase it down as they give their people a decent standard of living. Politically, they'll have every incentive in the world to give their people a decent life, right? Then they, have to stop, they can stop paying us a tariff. Give it to the people or give it to us. Easy choice. Give it to their people. When it's head-to-head -head competition, the American worker is the most productive worker in the world. Just won the Oscar again last year. They don't have to tip their hat to anybody. But if you're working in the good old USA, you got a ball and a chain and you got your hands tied behind your back by the good old US government. And the rest of the world lives free and has a tremendous advantage. Please, if you ever get to Hong Kong, go into China. Look at that and you'll say, wow. Okay, who's next? Right Hello, my name is Avery Gardner. I'm a first year student at the college and also a member of the Student Advisory Committee here at the Institute. Um, I wanted to ask you about the change in composition of American industry. Uh, you commented and noted in some of your charts that manufacturing jobs have been declining rapidly. Well, counteracting that has been the, uh, a tremendous increase in service sector jobs, which we've seen. 
Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the rise in service sector jobs yes, and how that's affecting the yes. American economy. Yes, now don't be misled by the stuff you get out of Washington. Jobs are increasing. What jobs? What do they pay? <coughs> See, we just get job numbers are going up. Are these all people making eight million bucks a year or people making 450 an hour? In the 1980s, the high growth jobs, the highest growth jobs in our country were janitor, food preparation worker, secretary, administrative type jobs, none paying enough money to support a family. The high growth jobs. Now guess what happened? Two million jobs went to Asia alone from our manufacturing plants. The high paying jobs went to Asia. The low paying jobs were being created here. The college graduates are making up beds and delivering breakfast. And we're saying we're gonna create, don't worry about it, it's gonna be service sector jobs. And they say, well, let's talk about some service sector jobs that you'd really love here. Well, Microsoft pays its people well, right? Is there any reason Microsoft has to be in the US? Do you have students from India here at the school? then I don't have to tell you how bright they are. There's, I'm, someday I hope to know why people in India are so smart. That is an incredibly bright group of people. And when it comes to computers, it's almost like they have a gene that none, none of the rest of us have. Seriously. Seriously, they do. And just move your software factory to Europe, use the information highway. You know, that's a Washington buzzword, but just say use satellites and downlink and ship it back and forth at the speed of light and get it done probably for 15 cents on the dollar. And if you don't think that's happening, go to India and look at these software factories. There is an unlimited supply of people around the world who will literally work for food. You say, well, that's right, we'll satisfy the need and then go back in the game. No, if you look at the total jobs in the world and you look at the number of people who are willing to work for food, you're looking at decades, and if you look at the birth rates in some of those nations, you'll never catch up. So let's be pragmatic, let's be realistic, and let's, the first rule of war is don't shoot yourself. And we're shooting ourselves economically with these dumb trade agreements. Now, you all have time to study this, and I'm sure every professor here will disagree with me, but I could care less. <laughs> um, I like that, because then there's a debate, right? Everybody kicks it around, and you, now just do me one favor, draw your own conclusions at the end of the show. But you draw your own conclusions. But when you look at all of these things happening around the world, you realize that we've placed ourselves at a serious disadvantage. Now we're about to do GATT. Do you study GATT in your classes, G-A-T-T? -T? You study GATT. And I'm sure that everything you hear is this is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Anybody hearing negative stuff about GATT? Of course not. The establishment wants it. Big business <laughs> wants it. The lobbyists want it. Now I just got down and said the L word. Okay? Okay. Study the World Trade Organization. And when you finish reading it, you'll say, no, Perot slipped me a bad copy. And then go get another one from somebody in Washington that's for it, and it's, you'll realize we have created something like the UN, only it doesn't have a security council. Our vote as the biggest market in the world is not a weighted vote. Pick the tiniest little island with three people on it in the world, it's a, a nation. They get to cast a vote just as heavy as ours. Do you think that these countries who want to ship into the United States are not gonna pick us off that way? They make the decisions, they make the rules, we're giving up a lot of our sovereignty to the World Trade Organization. And most of you are being taught that it's a wonderful thing. Anybody that wants to make a five-year bet on that, I'll meet you down here after the show. <laughs> and uh, see, in five years, I'll be slowing down a little bit and need the money. So it'll, it'll all work out. It'll all work out. And at the rate the dollar's declining, see, if you bet now, it won't cost you much later on. <laughs> but if all these young people go to work here tonight, in five years from now, we can get back together and have a celebration. Thank, thank you. Uh, my name is Micha Sifri. I'm an editor of The Nation magazine, right. and uh, I also publish the Perot periodical and unauthorized quarterly. Mr. Perot, my question for you is what exactly is your stake in this debate? An analysis of your 1992 financial disclosure statement revealed that approximately $2 billion of your $3 billion plus fortune was invested in government bonds. 
particularly tax-free bonds. Everybody knows the two things bondholders fear most are economic growth and budget deficits because they make interest rates go up and bond values go down. Last year, you campaigned hard against President Clinton's proposed economic stimulus package, which he quickly abandoned. As a result, interest rates dropped and the bond market boomed. My magazine, The Perot Periodical, estimated your personal wealth increased by a quarter billion dollars. Is isn't, yes, isn't your campaign for a balanced budget amendment, something that you called a phony solution when you ran for president, a continuation of you putting your mouth where your money is? And if, in fact, you don't stand to benefit from advocating these policies, when will you, when will you prove it? By well, everybody a needs his 15 minutes of fame. Let him have it. I'm not looking for any fame here. No. When will you prove it by making a full disclosure of your assets and financial dealings so that we, the people, can judge for ourselves? That was the question. Well, first, first, this is beautiful. This guy has something he calls a pro quarterly. Very carefully. Pro periodical. Never, never, calls, never calls me to see if the facts are straight. Your people won't take our calls. Now, now, wait a minute. Never calls to see if the facts are straight and prints whatever his conclusions are. Well, you know, it's a free society, and you can have a free and irresponsible press, which is fine. Uh, and, you know, well, you, or you can try to get your facts, but his facts couldn't be more wrong on the fact that I made money on my bond holdings. He makes the most ridiculous assumptions in the world to draw those conclusions. See, when rates go down, it costs me money. I didn't make money. But, so it's, it's, it's the worst of all worlds to be losing money and having this guy print that I'm making money. <laughs> now, if, 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 if something like that had happened, I'd stay here and we'd have a big party. But it, it did not happen, and it was completely misinterpreted, and I assume maybe he just doesn't understand numbers. But uh, I don't know what the problem is. But I can assure you that nothing we ever do politically has anything except spend money has anything to do with my financial status. My financial status is, as I've said earlier, I'm very, very lucky, and I am using the resources I have to try to leave a better country, let's put it on a very narrow basis, for my children and grandchildren. But I can't, it's really broader than that. But I think most of you would accept the fact that an old granddad and a dad would do that for his children. But I just, couldn't stand to turn out the lights without having done everything I could to make sure that you all have the same opportunities I had. See, all I had was an idea. I didn't have any money. I wasn't all that smart. I took my idea to IBM, and God bless them, they heard me out to the top of the corporation, and they weren't interested. Tom Watson, now IBM was a great opportunity. See, I was just a kid salesman, and Tom Watson Jr. made calls with me on the street. Now, there's a company that was working then, right? So he knew me then, but they said no. And they, the reason they gave is at that point in time, hardware was 80% of the revenues of the market. Software was 20%. IBM had the 80% locked up. They weren't interested in the 20%. Years went by. I was, happened to be in Colorado. This voice called out in a little restaurant and says, there's the one that got away. And I looked over, there's Mr. Watson. He says, come here, Ross. And I walked over, shook hands with him. He was with Senator Percy. And he said, now, Tell me again why we didn't take your idea. And I said, Mr. Watson, y'all were getting 80% of the revenues. You had the market locked up. Uh, you weren't interested in the other 20%. Well, by then, in big computers, it was 60% software, 40% hardware. Little computers, it was like 90% uh, software, 10% hardware. He said, did you know the ratios would change? And I said, no. He says, you really didn't foresee? I said, no, sir. I just, when you weren't getting any of it, 20% looked pretty good to me. And with that kind of thing, so I have literally, now again, being lucky in business is one thing, but then to be lucky in marrying a wonderful woman and mother is another. And then to have five children and all five be too good to be true, that's another. And then going all the way back to the beginning, in the Depression, I was born rich because I had the world's sweetest, finest parents. They didn't have any money, but they gave me everything parents could give a child and probably the thing that drives me is all they ever did all their lives was sacrifice for me and my sister. My dad had to drop out of school as, as when he was 14 because his dad died, go to work to take care of his mother as a Texas cowboy. He's a whole lot smarter than I am. Never got to go to college. My mother was very bright, couldn't afford to go to college, graduated from high school. Their dream was that we could go to college. We were the first in our family to go to college. Now that's the American dream. And we have an obligation to keep that. 
Now, I endure uh, this kind of stuff. It would be very easy just to say, life's too short to put up with it. But uh, this is all part, I guess, of being in public life. And here at the Kennedy School, and so one of the things you might as well face is that if you ever really care enough about anything to just give yourself to it, then you have to endure stray bullets and you know people that don't get their facts straight, don't make an effort to get their facts straight, and uh, they can print anything they want to print. You just have to keep going. We're, uh, I'm afraid we're uh, way over time. I apologize to all the people who still have questions. I want to thank all of you, and especially to thank our guest, Ross Perot. Okay, but now, okay. Testing, testing, one, two, now, testing. All, all you young tigers here tonight, I wore you out. See, he had to, he had to blow the game here. <laughs> And let the record show they put more steel in the old cars. Okay, I know you're worn out. You've got to get back to the dorm. But uh, just want to let you know that I, I stuck with you at the end. I enjoyed every single minute of it. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to stay here for a while or do you want to go back? No, we'll stay here. Okay. Stay here. How are you? I